Hello, everyone, and welcome to Lab Manager's Ask the Expert webinar series. My name is Mary Beth Didana, and I'll be moderating today's discussion, Automating Diagnostics, Lessons Learned from the COVID-19 Frontline. We like our webinars to be very interactive, so we encourage you to submit your questions to us at any point during today's webinar. Our speakers will address these questions during the question and answer session following their presentation. To ask a question or to leave a comment, simply type your query into the Q&A box, which can be located on the right-hand side of your screen. We will try to address as many questions as possible during our time together, but if we happen to run out of time, I will forward any unanswered questions to today's speakers and they can respond to you directly if possible. Additional resources for today's presentation are also located on the right-hand side of your screen. And I would like to remind you that this webinar recording will be available on demand shortly following this live presentation. So please watch your emails for information from Lab Manager on how to access this free video. I would also like to thank our sponsor, Automata, whose support allows Lab Manager to offer these webinars free of charge to our readers. So with that, I would like to introduce you to our presenters for today's webinar. Nick Pattinson leads, leads Automata's fast-growing lab automation team. An engineer at heart, he was awarded the Gibbs Proxim Assessit and Sir William Siemens Medal, recognizing him as one of the top engineers in his cohort at Oxford University. In previous roles, he has worked on the build of aircraft carriers, the design of the next generation of nuclear submarines, and was the architect of a big data analytic tool which could identify issues within the supply chain of one of the UK's largest grocery retailers. Nick joined Automata in 2019, initially leading product development teams before moving to spearhead Automata's entry into the life sciences market, where he now leads the development of specialist solutions and services to meet increasing demand for automation from lab-based organizations. David Wells is recognized as being one of the 100 powerful advocates for pathology in the global community by the Pathologist magazine in 2018, 2019, 2020, and 2021. Until June 2021, David was leading the NHS England and Improvement Pathology Consolidation Program, seeking to deliver efficient, high-quality quali pathology services across England. Three years on pathology services are embracing this considerable change at a pace not previously seen, with pathology service reconfiguring as proposed on track, with industry reconfiguring likewise to match the new models of delivery. David led NHS England's laboratory response to the, the COVID-19 pandemic, managing technology deployment, capacity, funding, and workforce, ensuring that all capacity requirements are met. He's advising ministers and providing policy and strategic direction. David was appointed chief executive of the Institute of Biomedical Science in June 2021 to lead this global professional body representing 20,000 members across 71 countries. And additionally, David was appointed a scientific lead for pathology for the NHS in London. Nick and David, thank you for joining us today. Thanks a lot. Thanks for the intro. Um, Thank you. Yeah, so we'll we'll get going. And the topic is, I know everyone will have already been aware, is focusing on automating diagnostics and what we can learn from COVID. I think, firstly, I want to say thanks to David for joining us on this. I've, I've had the pleasure of working with David quite a lot over the last few months, and I think it's it's pretty rare to find someone who can talk with the level of insight and experience as David from having done the job right down as a biomedical scientist, lived the day job, and then lived the pressures of running specific labs and, and all the way, of course, most recently to running NHS pathology, uh, NHS improvement um, side of, as head of pathology over what has to be said to be probably the most challenging year of any diagnostics organization to go through. So, David, thank you for your time. No, my pleasure. My pleasure. Looking forward to these conversations uh, as as we always have. So, um, I think let me let me first start by introducing uh, Automata a little bit more. I'm, I'm aware that there'll be some people who may not have heard of us. And if we can flip to the video, I'll talk over it because it probably brings to life what, what we do. So... Automata, Automata, we are a lab automation company. What that means is what, what we do is we focus on bringing together, creating the connective tissue of the lab, right? So we bring together various different multi-vendor systems in order to automate total workflow automation rather than partial automation. I think the approach we've taken is built on two sort of fundamental beliefs. 
The first is that any lab, no matter how small and low their throughput, versus any la how, however large, and some of the labs we're seeing right now being created, the throughputs are extraordinary, such as the mega labs, should be able to leverage the same automation technology in order to deliver their service. And that, that's why we take such a modular approach. The other fundamental belief is that no one supplier, no one company can provide the best equipment for every step of the workflow. Um, and so what we are always trying to do is create that connective tissue that brings together the best solutions for each of those tasks and be able to bring that into a total workflow automation in order to put the power in the customer's hands to specify what they need and solve a number of problems that come off the back of ending up in a single supplier uh, type model. So that, that's us and let's get going on into, into the conversation, David, if that works for you. Yeah. I think the place that we have to start, right, is the, lo the last year, last two years, it feels like, but last year and a half has been a pretty extraordinary time. I think the big question on everyone's mind is where does that leave us now? Like today, where does that leave us and the challenges for the technology services, especially yeah. the NHS? So, so, I mean, it has been, it's been incredibly challenging um, two years. And I think what it, what it has shown us is that the requirement to deliver a timely response to a whole host of things um, is one thing that globally we've we're not really we've not really been geared up towards we've been used to the idea of delivering new technologies over a, a set period of time as they as they emerge um, and you know, it, it's a, a woefully short time window so a woefully long time window from new technology becoming available to it being introduced and that's uh, true certainly within England um, I suspect it's true across the, across the world and what the last two years taught us was actually we need to be far more agile in what we do. Now, as you said about you know the best of breed, if you like, will not always come from one vendor. And the thing that you know we found ourselves in a in a prime situation was trying to access the right technology at the right time with the right performance criteria, etc., meant that actually we were buying machines, we're buying equipment, deploying it in a way that was very resource hungry in terms of people, very resource hungry in terms of our scientists. And so we, we as, a, as a country, if you like, um, upscaled our, our diagnostic, our, our molecular pathology diagnostic capability um, from being, being able to do something in the region of for molecular uh, microbiology, about 300,000 tests per year to doing that every day. Mm -hmm. um, and that actually, the, the, in England, we end up in a situation where we had a ability to do about 700,000 tests per day. Uh, and that is a significant ratcheting up. And that meant the speed of technology deployment, the pressure put upon our scientists to deliver that, the, the supply chain, all those things really showed us that, A, one, we could we could do it if we were, if we were under that pressure. But it also showed that there are a lot of weaknesses in that. And um, I think one of the things that we found was, you know, supply chain on a, resting on a single supplier is problematic. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, our, our future must be able to be one of those multiple, multiple vendors supplying that to us in a, in a range of different ways. Uh, it also you know, showed us actually that, you know, there's no single solution. It's not throw more workforce at it. It's actually a combination of let's get look at the technology, look at what we can do and how we use it. Um, and, you know, that busy two years, and I mean exceptionally busy two years for everyone around the world, um, really showed, you know, what's possible, but actually what, where the where the pressure lies. And I think I'm sure your experience uh, working with a number of labs across the UK was the same. It was how do we make this work faster? You know, do it now, not, you know, not in a week's time, not in you know, a year's time. Yeah, I think you're exactly right. And there are so many there are so many topics within what you just said that I, it would be great to dig into and we'll, we'll see how we get to on time because I, I think like fundamentally the biggest thing that changed was exactly your point on the time to deploy technology, right? And and I think that to me is one of the biggest challenges that we should try and look at going forwards is what what does that look like going forwards? Like We've seen that we can do it faster than ever before and create, therefore, transformative solutions to problems. But like that came from a place of 
heavy single-minded alignment al- alignment on a on a particular challenge and then a budget i'm sure but yeah well, i suppose that's almost the question as well like what what were those what did covid fundamentally change that enabled that to happen and is there any of those forces that we can hold on to for the point of better going forward so I think I think the key one was actually it brought diagnostics to the fore within governments. So, yeah. you know, um, I would I would say that certainly within England, um, you know, the number of people who are experts within pathology in diagnostics who are in the room deciding or, or making decisions was woefully inadequate at the start. And I think that, and again, this is not a question of the English government or, or the UK government. And actually, I suspect this is right across the globe that requirement for me to understand the ins and outs of how you respond to pandemics uh, was, was actually probably woefully lacking. And um, I think very quickly government realised it needs to get some experts in the room, and it did. Um, and it very quickly worked out we need to throw money and support people, at these experts, in delivering the solutions. And, and you know, thankfully, we did. Um, and I think what we've got to hang on to is that visibility, because we're talking about, uh, again, we're talking about COVID at the moment, sure. But actually, cancer recovery times, um, again, in the UK, are, are woefully inadequate compared to other OECD countries. Um, we can't improve on those unless we've got smarter, better diagnostics that are delivered in a more timely way. Um, I think other countries in the same vein as us, actually, w- would better benefit from um, faster, better diagnostics. But that requires politicians to understand, OK, if I put money into this area, I get outcomes better elsewhere. Any 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 system's got a state paid health system. You know, you make choices about where you spend your money, um, and it is about making sure you're spending money in the right way, in the most effective way. And perhaps, you know, like I said, going back to that, that my first point, you know, getting government and people in charge of policy to understand that pathology can have a major impact. That can that's where the money can come from. If we can keep hold of that, we'll we'll make a big, big sea change. Yeah, it's interesting because I was talking. I was talking to a big group of um, various NHS pathology lab managers, and um, a lot of them were talking about exactly this: that previously pathology has been in in the background, and it's always been really difficult to tie, like a test being delivered in a better time or whatever, to an outcome, and and because of that, what you end up measuring it based on is outputs. So like how fast, et cetera, mm. rather than the outcomes. But but the result of all of that ends up being that it's harder to make the case for funding because unless you can tie it to the value and the outcome, it's really hard to state your case on why that's more important than the emergency recovery to the situation that's happened because yeah. that test didn't happen. And, and, and I think it's such an interesting one to think about how, how how you hold on to that because i agree that that's the biggest difference right it is very clear why testing matters in covid it is very clear what happens if you don't invest in it so there was investment but i don't know how we hold on to that and create that kind of business case for lab managers etc going forwards it, it, it is a difficult one because you know we can we can sign up to bed stays we can sign up to uh, like i said like um, pure outcomes um, we can either sign up if you and again my my ambition is always around early diagnostics so actually using diagnostics much earlier on and, and as you quite rightly say covid was a prime example you know the faster we detected someone who was positive the sooner we could quarantine them the sooner we can stop and break the chains of tra- transmission but the same is true for uh, any infectious disease and that has an impact on our antimicrobial resistance the same is true for any cancer the faster you catch it, the better the outcomes will be. Uh, the same is true for any musculoskeletal disease or any, uh, any genetic disorder. The sooner you identify it, the sooner you can take uh, steps to ameliorate or treat or, or cure um, those, those different conditions. And that has an impact across, across right across the board of what healthcare costs. And we've always been very reactive. I mean, and and I, I, I talk about this an awful lot, I know, but we're always very reactive. People turn up and say, I have symptoms of, the clinician will check them, and you understand, order the, the diagnostic tests, and then treat them on the, on, the, on the basis of the results. And we do need to move that far further up to the, the, the chain. So you know, a patient is being predictably sought 
yeah. out for what's tested would be would add value to their life at, at, yeah whatever stays their life is or nondescript symptoms and those things now it, again it does cost more in the terms of diagnostics but what it delivers in savings are bed stays fewer hospital appointments and also probably the most important is it delivers a better quality of life for people who don't end up presenting in emergency departments with end stage ovarian cancer you know so it, it really has a massive impact across the board and, it, and it's it is a big sea change um, and it's one that will, will take probably a long time to do but it's one we should be pushing for and i think then why why is this important in the conversation we have to say which is all about automating technology of course is because this means you now need to be able to test smarter probably in higher volumes probably you know not necessarily in the traditional sense that we do as we see them now so I and mean, the way that the nhs in england is, is organized we have networks of laboratories and these should be large hub and slope models and actually you need to be able to take patient samples and send them into, into larger centers that are working 24 7. Uh, that are able to deliver on that 24 7 commitment it means that clinicians can can expect the time you know, the, the turnaround time so that they can act accordingly so they can say i've sent a sample in for a i don't know uh, a cancer marker I can reliably predict that my result will be back in 24 hours. So I can reliably inform my patient or plan for my patient for X, Y, Z to happen. If we talk about, if we go back a bit and talk about AMR, so antimicrobial resistance, you know, if the faster we get patients to targeted antibiotic treatments, the better for the whole globe in terms of uh, antibiotics. And, and it's about that, that, that ticking clock. And I think the, um, when we look at automating labs we've done it in biochemistry labs and we've done it in hematology labs but there are some labs out there or some aspects of biochemistry and hematology labs where we've not managed to automate mm. and if we automate it we can really switch the dial from a 48 hour turnaround time to a 12 hour turnaround time and that has yeah. dramatic impact upon what what uh, is livable yeah i think it's so interesting interestingly this this dynamic exists in social care as well so i worked for a while in social care and you have exact same thing of like if you can get someone out of the bed and re-able them as quickly as possible you it's more upfront cost but it saves in the long term yeah. and delivers a better outcome so i think it's it's fascinating to see the parallels in different areas of um of ultimately what is our same medical system right and and it's the same challenge like how how do you in such a budget tight uh, environment how do you how do you make the case to say spending more now has better benefits later and then you're trying to prove that against what is becomes this counterfactual of mm. you, know, you don't have that you don't have sight of the counterfactual right of like, no, they, they've got even if you didn't do it. yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so i think um and, and we'll get into then how the raw automation plays in that in a bit. I think I think um, one question for me that comes off the back of that is: Do you think do you think COVID? Two questions actually. So one: Do you think COVID has started to show people the potential with diagnostics and this preemptive bit? Do you think people are making that link because? it could be seen as isolated and separate to it. So that, that's the first question. And I suppose when I'm saying people are specific, you mean like funding wise. Um, yeah. Then the second question, but let's come on to that in a second, was about this dynamic between the difference between a screening test and a diagnostics test and, and how, we, how we should be thinking about that or, and whether you believe there should be a difference in those. But yeah. let's start with the first bit on like, uh, is that realization happening? I think it, I think it is. So um, and and what's my evidence for that? Well, the evidence really is when I when I was running um, the, the England's uh, pathology reconfiguration program. So we, those of you who know the, the history of pathology within England, uh, know that we've had like a twenty year strategy to move towards a more hub and spoke centralised model of delivering pathology, um, much like the rest of the globe does actually. But we've always run a very very bespoke hospital by hospital system, and we we need we recognise we need to move away from it. Um, I led that program for for um, ended up being about four years, uh, but it was me and um, probably five other people part time in across the whole of the country. So a population of about about 58, 60 million people. We had five people who were driving a, a, a national policy of change. 
yeah. and, and we did very well actually. I mean, like, there's, there's a there's a there's a, a lot to be said for small agile teams. I'll tell you that. But but during COVID and post COVID, um, the size of the diagnostic teams involved in driving strategy in within England. Uh, quadruple. So I was replaced by three people. When I left the team. I was replaced by three people. The team expanded to include a lot more analysts and uh, and policymakers, and um, uh, there's a lot more interest in that. I moved across to be the head of uh, pathology for London Region, which is a obviously a London a large a, a large capital city. Um, they had one half time person who actually I was it because they they didn't fill the post, so I covered for it as a favour. Um, I've now got a team of, of about, I think about 10 of us within yeah. that team. Yeah, so you see people that are putting money behind it because they recognise the importance. And the conversation is not about COVID. The conversation mm -hmm. is about diagnostics in general. It's about cancer recovery. It's about healthcare recovery from the pandemic and then improving right across the board, you know, about the quality of access, about provision of services, where does it sit? And, you know, it it has really ratcheted up the conversation and it's not going to go away because I think people have recognized this is the solution to a whole host of problems that people hadn't realized. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's a, that's a really positive thing. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I'm aware of time. I, the, the, the other question I have, maybe let's talk about it very quickly is there was a lot of discussion at the start of COVID about this difference between a screening test and a diagnostics test, right? Like yeah. a screening test not needing to have the same level of um, accuracy based on it being there to create for the for a general population. What's your view on the like that difference and where and the positioning of that difference in a diagnostics like yeah. in an organization going forwards? So, so I think so. It has its place. So, so I'll be very careful. Those of you who are in the UK, screening has a particular definition about detecting disease before it becomes prevalent. But what we're here talking about is we're talking about a, a test that you might use to to point towards a diagnostic test. So not the true definition of screening. But yeah. actually, we've seen the effects of lateral flow devices and um, um, other other sort of types of. Um, non-PCR based testing for COVID. Now it's not as good as a PCR test, but if it enables you to be testing more people quickly to enable more self-testing to get people to behave in a certain way, um, or even if it just points you towards people who are at a higher risk, it has a massive value. And, and I was talking about earlier on about that proactive diagnostics. Mm. But proactive diagnostics, we can actually start to include tests that are not the answer, but can just work out who our population is. And we might be able to say to people, okay, well, we think you might be more important to look at urgently than you. You might wait a few more days. And perhaps I'll give you some examples of what we might include in in, um, in that. It could well be, um, you know, the the, the uh, um, undertaking particular tests that perhaps have a very non-specific um, marker for a disease. Do those tests more often, but actually then working out who the people you might want to see may be a way of doing that. So using data better, using risk analysis better to drive people into patient pathways is one. Or even using things which you might not consider to be tests. Um, you know, there's the cadence of a, we mentioned social care earlier on. If you manage to monitor the cadence of a patient, or, of, or sorry, of an individual, uh, perhaps an elderly individual, and if their cadence changed, you might say, well, actually, you know what, as a, um, my care system might prioritise visiting that person because their cadence, has, you know, their step length has changed. And that might be a marker of flu, it could be a marker of frailty, mm -hmm. marker of all sorts of things. So these are things that we could be doing to optimise patient pathways through genuine diagnostics. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's a really interesting, I, I suspect it's a really interesting space for us to be getting into. Um, and it can really help steer more people to the right place faster, I think. Yeah. It's incredibly interesting. Okay, great. Well, so if we were to leave the section and kind of take away from it the key bits that I think the big challenge but opportunity, the challenge has always been keep getting pathology visible in the public eye. And I think that challenge and has sort of COVID's helped it almost resolve in terms of we have that visibility. And, and if then the second thing we're saying is really this is a case of how do we start one enabling more preemptive testing and two measuring the outcome of that in order to create that full loop and say this is why it matters and continue to keep diagnosing the industry i think that's a great place 
for us to um, to start moving on to the next question, which then is around automation, right? Like, mm -hmm. how how does automation help meet the growing di di diagnostic demand? And, and yeah, you started talking about this, and then uh, we it would be great to kick off there, maybe. Yeah, well, I think I mean the the, the beauty of automation, of course, is that. Um, uh, it, it, is it doesn't always need the same level of breaks and sleep time that uh, that people need. Um, now, if I was looking again, this is this is English experience. You know, we already have some quite large laboratories, particularly say in microbiology, and we know there are systems such as Keystra and, and similar systems of that working within microbiology. They are large platforms. They don't replace people, but what they do enable us to do is to work at a time which is right for the diagnostic sample. So you can read plates at the exact time those plates need reading. Uh, you can swab plates or, get, or take them for reculturing at the exact time they need to do it. And, and the workforce required to behave in the same way is, is far greater than we've got. And it would add such a massive amount of cost into the system that actually diagnostic tests will become uh, you know, a, a, not a value add. There'll be there'll become a genuine strain upon it. So I think what automation does is it frees us up from that working day without at any point reducing the performance criteria or the quality. And in fact, I suspect, particularly in the, in the example I've just given there, or in the example of uh, sensitivities in my, in, the, in use of antibiotics, it can actually only improve the outcome. So we know that in England. Um, time to target treatment in antibiotics in labs that aren't automated or, or don't work 24-7 uh, can be as much as 36 hours. Um, by contrast, those that are working 24-7 or heavily automated, it's four hours. And it really is that stark. It's average of 36 hours or four. You know, and it, and it, it, that's the massive difference to uh, the, the disease causes some or, or whether we're treating someone the right way. It may not impact on patient outcomes because they might still get the same coverage in terms of the antibiotic they're using. But long term, as a society, that's not an optimal use of antibiotics. So, yeah. so I mean, that's the sort of thing that automation enables us to do. And volumes, again, you can't handle the volumes. There's no way we can handle the volumes of COVID tests if we're doing them the way we're doing them at the very start of the pandemic. You know, yeah. it wouldn't have worked. You know, we ha we have to automate it, um, and all the students and people we brought in to help run our laboratories during the height of the pandemic, they've all got other things to do. They've got their researchers, they're working in other departments, they were students. You know, they aren't there yeah. long term, but the volumes will be. This is always the bit that amazes me is like how the the kind of caliber and the uh, amount of qualifications training that people have done to arrive and then spend so long having to do manual tasks constantly blows my mind when when you also talk about at exactly the same time this huge gap in in that skill set right in mm. this ability and one of the labs one of the labs um we deployed and we were going around uh, for a tour uh, quite recently um, and it's always nice when, you know, the customer's almost selling you back this, this system that's been created. But they said, like, look, and we said, why, why does this matter to you? Like, why has this been um, big? And, and the big thing they were saying was, you know, I have this one biomedical scientist here is running all of these tests. If we wanted to do this in a different way, I would need that level of expertise times 10, 20, something like that. And yeah. we're struggling to even find that one person. So how, this is not possible unless you automate. And what's more, we can get the most out of this individual um, because suddenly she can be focused on the real critical part rather yeah. than the day to day. Absolutely, and and and, and absolutely, and I, you know, as a as a biomedical scientist myself, you know, I, you when I was in the laboratory. You'd spend a lot of time doing stuff that actually you didn't need to be as qualified as run. And, and in the UK, you know, we're talking about, you know, a, a, a degree followed by at least eighteen months worth on on the job training and plus some um, statutory registration um, qualifications. Plus then going into do masters, PhDs, etc. You know, you're talking about people who've got an incredible amount of uh, skills and experience, and they're, they're doing things such as standing in front of a machine pressing buttons. Mm. Add a lot of value to someone's work of their life when actually they're spending maybe five ten minutes really using their full skill set, yeah. and automation allows that shift to 
you use that person. A phrase we use is working top of license. So you, know, you want to be spending as much time as possible adding the value you add at the, at the maximum. And automation does help that. It does help that shift. Like I said, we saw it in biochemistry and hematology many years ago, um, and it's worked very effectively. We now have you know, biochemistry laboratories that process tens of thousands of tests every day uh, with maybe two or three people, and that's that's what it should be aiming for. Yeah, and and I think I think um, the other bit the other bit that um, for me that's so important, and and you talked about this. There are two bits in automation that become really important, and we start following this line down. One is you talked about this hub and spoke model, which I couldn't agree more with, and and I think for us that's always been something very present in our mind is this idea that one type of lab at one type of throughput you design specifically for them and they have access to this platform, but that platform is in no way flexible enough, modular enough, small enough, that it can also work in one of those, um, uh, one of the spokes. It, it seems wrong. Like it should be able to be supporting both sides if, if necessary to enable that speed of response where you need it and also support the efficiencies that you need that obviously a, a hub type model will pr uh, prove. So yeah, I'm interested what you, what your thoughts on that side of things are. Well, well, yeah, I mean, again, it's one of those, it's one of those challenges. I think, um, again, in the UK, we've, we've had a couple of challenges with, with our supply chain uh, during the pandemic um, where quite significant suppliers to our health system were unable to supply particular stocks. And what that really, really did highlight was actually, depending on a single vendor, um, really is a, a, a quite a large weakness in your business continuity. Um, you, you quite right to point out as well that because you're relying on a single vendor, it's often a one size fits all. It means you're, you lock out other vendors because actually, you know, the that's the nature of the way that works. And I think certainly, from my point of view, and I think certainly the lessons learned are we need to move to a point where we are more agile about who we work with, uh, that actually a multitude of vendors is going to be really important. And I think that's when the automation struggles, because actually, why would a major supplier spend lots of time investing in automation of their platform to plug it into someone else's platform? The answer is they won't. Um, and we've not really seen the UK market, I'm not sure about other parts of the world, but we've not really seen a, a, a like an automation solution that's at your extra or additional to or outside of the, ven the vendor. Uh, and I think that's where things become really interesting because you know, mm. you've got some small suppliers who are doing exceptionally good, um, have exceptionally good kits that don't really get a look in um, because they're not part of the bigger, you know, the, the, the bigger system. Uh, and I think that will be quite, I think that'd be quite a big game changer in that, that part. And then the modular side of it, again, often I, I mentioned the keystra, the keystra deployment is is of a certain size. You have to have a certain workflow to make it viable. Any mm -hmm. below that, no point. And to give you an idea, in, 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 the, in England, that's maybe one or two of our mid-sized hospitals worth of work before mm -hmm. it's viable, really. Um, and that's not suitable if you're talking about a hub and spoke model. You know? And again, that consistency of performance across spoke and hub means that you want to keep some, you know, some consistency. So again, Anything that helps build a small scale automation and large scale automation is going to be a yeah, you know, it's going to be really important for that future. Yeah, yeah, and I think that mul that multi vendor thing is such an interesting one, and and it was something I know we've talked about before. It's something that's like honestly for for um, automata from our point of view was like key when we were looking at the problems, but also the opportunities in the space, like the amount of innovation that's happening at an instrument at a like kit level is incredible and yet it doesn't seem to be like leveraged and adopted at the level that it should and and like for us for us that has always stayed as something which is we look at our company and we say right we, we want to enable something and to go to to deliver that value as quickly as possible we want to innovate on as few things as possible and you look at that instrument level, you look at the kit level, and you think, why would we innovate there? Like, there are yeah. amazing people out there that are doing incredible work in those areas, but currently it's unleverageable by these organizations because it just can't support that side.
Yeah, I think mean, you're right. And, and again, and that's the point, I suppose, is that wouldn't we all go to the experts in the field that they're in, if you like, in the ideal world? And, and I think sometimes we're perhaps not seeing that happen. Yeah, it's really interesting. Okay, so I think um, the plan the plan is now we start taking some questions. So um, let let's see let's see what people. I think a few have been coming up. So I don't know, um, Mary Beth, do you rejoin us at this point? Yes, great. Thanks very much, uh, Nick and David, for a great conversation. Uh, so as Nick said, we will move on to the audience Q&A at this point. So we do have some in at this point. And uh, the first one says, if you had a magic wand and could develop a system to automate one process in diagnos diagnostics or pathology, what would that be? <laughs> Interesting. You go, you go, David. Yeah, well, you know what? There's not one, there's not one single answer here, actually, I suppose. is, is probably Because actually... You know, everyone could probably automate something. Um, I, I suppose um, there's uh, Nick and I have talked a lot about mass spectrometry, um, and you know we we have in in the very highly specialist parts of diagnostics we use mass spectrometers, um, and they still rely quite heavily on people doing the prep, um, people loading the, the mass specs up, even though they've got automated sample handlers within them. Um, there's still a lot of manual steps there. And I think automating that reliably, there are some now on the market which are improving, but I think making it more, uh, th that more um, generous would, would be really useful. The other one, actually quite an interesting one, and um, perhaps it's part of the patient pathway, and, and you know, shock horror, we might not like this, but actually also automating things like phlebotomy. Um, so actually the, the process of taking the sample from the patient, um, improving the consistency, the quality of that, again, that could be quite an interesting thing to do. Um, although I'm not sure I'd want to be the guinea pig necessarily. <laughs> yeah. yeah, good job. Nice. Okay, should we move on to the next question? <laughs> okay, great, thanks. Um, just a quick reminder to our audience, you can submit your questions for Nick and David by typing them into the Q&A box located on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, and even if you don't have a question, we invite you to leave your comments and let us know uh, how you enjoyed this presentation, what you thought of it, and what you found useful. Uh, so the next question from our audience is, what do you think the life science industry and NHS diagnostics can learn from other sectors' approaches to automation? For example, Akato's approach to robotics in its distribution centers. I can take this one maybe to start with. So... Um... Look, I think I think there's loads. So, so Automata, for example, started. We started life as an automation company um, at our core, and, and and what we've learned in most of those se other sectors, we can very easily apply in lab automation. There, there are so many consistencies, particularly in the diagnostics space. Um, and conversations that I'm having with David. Gen on a general basis are almost always identical to the kind of conversation that I used to have with a load of people manufacturing stuff because you're worrying about the same core metrics and the same core. The other bit that I think is the most interesting trend that's happening um, in, in a, a manufacturing space that you can then start to reapply to um, diagnostics and that hub and spoke model is this move away from does automation enable you to have closer supply chains? So I like you can move away from having just a single big factory. How do I have factories that are distributed? It's exactly the same with this hub and spoke model, right? Like there are parts of that process that you want to be in the hub, that that is where the efficiency comes, but there are plenty that work far better in a spoke model. And that ability to be able to use automation to create both large systems and small systems and for that to be a similar type of system so that you are understanding one form of technology you can push releases updates onto those i think is is the most exciting bet for me if i if i could add my two pence worth it, it, I, I would say that what can we learn is we can learn a lot because so i, I had a, a conversation i'm not going to say who, who it was with around different aspects of the way we deliver pathology services in, in, in england and um, I pointed out the fact that actually, it, we were talking about logistics um, and said, look, actually, why don't we get the experts in logistics to design these bits for us and we leave it well alone because we, why, why should we work? Yeah, this is not our expertise. And that individual responded by saying, no, David, we need to know that better. Now, I still believe firmly 
the experts in logistics are the ones we should go to to tell us how to manage our samples and route them. Uh, we just need to say what we want to happen and how that, you know, how what the input is and what the output should look like. And the same goes for automation. You know, it, it's really important that we engage, from my, my in my humble view, that we engage the experts in these in these areas. What we've got to do as uh, as laboratorians and, and pathologists is to say, look, this is what you're going to get, and this is what I want to see at the outcome. Please make those things happen. Uh, but I'm not going to, I'm, you know, I'm not going to second guess you on those things. And I, I think that's one thing is, I suppose we, we, we as scientists, we'd like to know everything and all the details, and we probably need to let go of it. Is probably mm -hmm. the right answer. Um, but that's what we should learn because, you know, um, to break it down into its bare bones, pathology is a logistic game. It's a game of moving from A to B, and how do you do that in a way which delivers the right quality? That's what we're after, and I think that's the bit we need to, you know, employ the experts to each component of that. Yeah, I, I I think that's that's bang on. It's really interesting. Yeah, agreed. Okay, great. Thank you. Here's our next question from the audience. Can you give a practical example of a time when automation has helped address staff shortages in a pathology lab? So, I think I mean, the answer is it, it always does. So, I'm mean, um, I, I will give you. It's not necessarily sharp staff shortages, but improve the workflow of the use of people. Um, when I was um, working in the lab still, we, we saw one of the very early, uh, it was a, a day bearing dimension. Those of you who might remember that if you ever, if you worked in labs, now owned by Siemens, I think the, the RXL models are. And we had a very early automated uh, system called Streamlab. And it meant that our lab could, could go from having uh, five qualified scientists running these analyzers all day long, um, down to about two and a half. Uh, and at some points, we're just one qualified person running it. And that meant we were able to use the, the rest of our staff cohort in a far better way. Um, and, I, and I think that's really, really important. So it went literally from overnight, turn, turned on the machine, and we didn't need as many people. That didn't mean we lost people, not, not at all. We actually just made sure they were being employed in ways that, where they added the value. So, uh, and I think that's, that's where it worked really well. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I think it always does. But I also agree with the notion that I think it's very, we're a long way off this idea of like totally automated without any need for like expertise, scientific expertise in the loop. I think this is all about being able to enable those scientific experts to be leveraged to do what they're meant to be doing rather than um, like manual, manual tasks. Process. Yeah, indeed. Okay, great. Thank you. Here's our next question from the audience. Um, is there anything lost in automation? I worked with a toxin producer and we could smell and feel the different types, some unknown to science. So I, I saw this question and I, and I thought, what a good question. Um, is there anything lost? And, and the answer is, um, with every step where you introduce technology, uh, you, you don't necessarily lose things, but you have to remember what you haven't, what you do, you're not doing any, anymore. Um, I suppose it is probably the key thought part. So in a in an automated medical laboratory, the thing you've improved on is you improved on probably the quality, the consistency, the re reproducibility. But what you might lose over time is you might lose some of the the brain power, you know, the thinking behind actually how does the assay exactly work? How do I troubleshoot it if it goes wrong? Uh, do I have the manual dexterity to um, to prepare in the same way if I don't prepare on a regular basis? So there are things that are lost in a very subtle way, um, but you've just got to be, in my, my humble opinion, is you've just got to be aware of those. So making sure people's competence is, is maintained, that any training programs include the ins and outs of what you're not doing on a day-to-day -day basis so people understand how it works. And um, you know, I, I perhaps look right back to you know, the basis of our, my, my, our biochemist by background and you know, using colorimetry and spectrophotometry, you know, understanding how those work uh, is, is vital, even if you never ever see a calculation, you never see a filter, you never see a lens, you never see the reaction itself happening. Still remembering or knowing the theory behind it is important. And, it, and it's perhaps sometimes easier to forget that's needed because you may not need it most of the time. So, so it's a really good question. Um, the, the answer is I hope not. But I think, I think in practice, some of those subtle skills get lost. I, th I think one, one thing I'd add to this is, and we see it a lot, which, which is, I think this is why you have to have like a scientific expert involved in this whole process, right? And, and like that expertise is so important. However, the big problem with having individual 
qualitative idiosyncrasies like that is that it's very hard to scale and roll out to everyone. It's very hard to train anyone to do that. So suddenly you get massive differences in the service that different people are offering and being able to be provided. And I think the real genius comes from how you take those, that experience, how you take that like expertise, and then how you, te- you start trying to quantify that, right? You start trying to break down that and say, well, how do we solve that in a consistent way? which is ultimately all automation is, right? Like we want to turn all of those qualitative, unique brilliance of the individuals doing it and turn it into something consistent that now every patient can receive everywhere. So I think, yes, you need that person. The best version of that person is someone who can, who can work and has the goal of trying to make that systemic. All right, wonderful, thank you. Here's our next question from the audience. Do you envision the future of pathology networks to become fully automated, supported by MLA and AP, particularly for Spoke Labs ESL? Okay. So, I think so, so just to, for perhaps those who don't know what the, the uh, terminology is, so MLA is Medical Laboratory Assistant and AP is uh, Associate Practitioner. And um, so do I see this? So I think in a, in a truly uh, automated laboratory with... Uh, a good infrastructure, digital infrastructure, and IT connectivity, then you could see a spoke laboratory being run uh, by uh, staff who are, who are not uh, um, uh, state registered or, 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 or regulatory um, registered, um, but they would need to be supported fully by individuals who are. Um, now, I certainly, I when I was uh, working at um, uh, Guy's and Thomas's and King's College Hospital, we had one of our our ESLs was run on at night by AAP, um, connected seamlessly to the main laboratory where the qualified staff undertook reporting of all results. Uh, we had um, the, the, all the required safety steps in place and you know the backup for a courier to, to ship any samples that need to be shipped around. So, so the answer is yes, I can envision it happening and I think it isn't um, out with the ability for automation and IT to, to enable that. Um, but what it doesn't do is replace the need for qualified staff to be available to provide support. So that will never go. It's, it's probably the important part. All right, wonderful. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. Beyond digital pathology, are there any other digital transformation projects you are expecting for the future of pathology? So, so yeah, so I can't, I'll tell you something, because yes, there is. So the, the Department of Health and Social Care in England has recently released um, significant sums of money uh, to improve the digital and IT infrastructure within pathology and diagnostic um, services. So I think that will make a, a massive difference. Having the ability to connect systems together, the interoperability of result produced in Lab A to be shared with, with Hospital C and uh, and all those sort of things, reducing uh, duplication of testing, improving the cumulative effect of data um, will make a, a, a massive change in the way we do things. And I think the talking on about proactive diagnostics, a lot of that is based around um, data to work out what should I need to do, what, what tests are going to be relevant here, what's the cutoff for these tests in this circumstance. Uh, that requires all that data to be brought together. And, and in, again, one of the things in England with the, with the public health service is the data is actually pretty much uh, held on a national scale. So actually we are able to use that data in a way that's not, and nothing to do with identifiable data, just about the what's the outcome. If I have a cutoff at this point, what's the outcome? Uh, and we're certainly seeing that in a, in a whole range of areas, particularly in screening, where we're able to work out what the frequency of screening is, whether what the effect of that is, and whether we need to change them, um, all from the, the large data we hold. And, and we're talking about a population, like I said, about 58 million people. So those things will make a massive difference. Uh, and they're happening now, uh, um, but they will probably take a few years to come to fruition and, and be visible. So I, I would add one thing that um, I talked about earlier, which and, and Dave and I both talked about, like the best version of these types of labs are multi-vendor. That multi-vendor bit means starting to get different suppliers' equipment, different suppliers' system to work really well together. And 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 like that that is what changed in so many ways in the digital revolution, right? Is this is this um, 
ability for multiple different vendors to solve different problems and to latch onto each other. And, and if we can create a similar kind of environment, a similar kind of community, um, and, and most importantly, similar kind of business model that makes that work for all of those suppliers, that then drives a, a innovation, et cetera, into the industry, it will be transformative. So that, that would be the digital transformation that um, I, I hope that we will see. All right, wonderful. Thank you so much. So this does bring us to the end of this webinar, and I would just like to remind all of you that this webinar will be available for free on-demand viewing shortly following this live presentation. So on behalf of Lab Manager, I'd like to thank Nick Pattinson and David Wells for all the hard work they put into their presentation. And I would like to thank all of you for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us today. I would once again like to thank our sponsor, Automata, whose support allows Lab Manager to offer these webinars to you free of charge. For more information on all of our upcoming or on-demand webinars or to learn more about the latest tools and technologies for the laboratory, please visit our website at labmanager.com. We hope you can join us again. Thank you and have a great day. Thanks a lot.